Today we are covering a handful of modern Omega watches that on paper technically don't exist. Technically. Because as we know, for as long as we have had watches on our wrists, there have been watches made for military applications. In fact, some of the earliest wrist-worn watches were used in the trenches of the First World War. So what we do know is that these unit Omegas, they are not produced in large numbers. The chances of us as civilians owning them even getting them in our hands, it's highly unlikely. But we do love details. We do love talking about watches that don't necessarily exist. And I love putting together a good render. So it's a match made. But let's take some time to cover these unique mill spec pieces. When I started in the watch hobby 10 years ago, one of my favorite areas of focus was the military watch. It still is to this day, because in many ways they are that perfect representation of tools being built for a function, designed to be discreet while also being regimental. In more ways than one, they are a designer's dream. They have a specific purpose, they're made for certain needs, and well, there are more than a few that have been successful. And let's just also say that they look fantastic. And for many years I dreamed of owning a Millsub, a Tudor Snowflake, a watch like this. And at this stage, it seems the market is getting kind of saturated with these sorts of pieces. Are they losing their potency? I don't know. Let's move on. Now, as we know today, the analog military watch could be seen as and considered quite a defunct item. I mean, the simple Casio does everything and more for the typical watch wearer. And for years, since the late 2010s, we have often discussed how the mechanical watch has seen its time and it's being phased out of service. But in fact, to our joy, we are hearing and seeing more and more that the mechanical analog watch is experiencing something of a renaissance in this area. Now, whether it's for marketing purposes or for clandestine work, it remains to be seen. I don't know how great it is to have your military insignia engraved on the case back of a watch if you are captured in enemy territory, but hey, that's just me. I'm not very smart. But more than a handful of brands in the modern era have been creating watches for certain branches of the military. And we know some of these names incredibly well. Breitling, big time. I'm sure we've all seen the watches of espionage video. But one of the major suppliers in recent times, wouldn't you believe it, is Bremont. And I don't know how these contracts are going to be received or how it's going to change over time under new management, but hey. Now we know some of the legends in this area and we could sit here talking about them all day ad nauseum. And as we know, Omega as a brand, they are not strangers when it comes to producing mil-spec watches, as we will later see. Even going as far back as the 1930s, they were creating military pilot watches. And more recently, a model like the iconic 165.024 Seamaster 300, a piece that predated the Rolex mil sub, very much set the criteria and the standard for the development of the Ministry of Defense dive watches. And it's just an outstanding machine that represents the mid to late 1960s. So after quickly running through that timeline, I thought to get us a little bit more oriented for the modern Omegas that we're going to look at, I would discuss watches that have been made over the last 15 years, specifically for certain branches of the military in small batch numbers. A good reference to start is the 2008 Rolex Sea Dweller Somatsotori. It's believed that a batch of about 79 watches were made, and the only real thing that separates this from the regular production model is the fact that there is that small octopus insignia at the 9 o'clock position. It's a great looking watch, highly collectible and sought after. You do see them come up sometimes. Another good example is Rolex's Black Dial Explorer 2 that was made in 2012 with a very specific case back engraving for the 22 Regiment SAS. Only 100 of these pieces were made. If you look to the front of it, it looks like any other Rolex Explorer 2. When you look to the case back, you see it has a very specific engraving. How about the 2012 Omega Planet Ocean XL with a case back engraving for the 22 Regiment SAS? So when you compare a watch like the Somatsutori and the Explorer 2 with a model like the 1970s Rolex Millsub, you can see how much of a difference there is. These watches are regular production models with something unique added to them compared to an entirely bespoke watch with different hands, different bezel, and every other detail. Now, one piece from Tudor that arrived in 2021 that I think in a lot of ways has shaped this landscape, the FXD. This was by no means a watch that was intended to be made for your average everyday consumer. Only those in the know understand what a fixed bar case is about. Only the real nerds in this field know what fully graduated bezels are about, know what countdown bezels are about. When these watches arrived, Tudor produced two variants. The civilian variant with four lines of text and the unofficial two-liner, the reference 2597B. 
only sold and dispatched to the Commando Hubert. A few of them have arrived on the open market and we can see that they were supplied with a handful of different strap options as well as clips and other details. The case backs of these were sterile, they just said MN21. They did not have an anchor denoting the Marine National and chronometer certifications. And this has now evolved. We now see a US Navy option and I'm sure this is not the last time we're going to see the FXD used for military purpose. I do look forward to seeing the day when we get an all black out variant of this watch, maybe a left hand crown. Now where Tudor was quite loud talking about and promoting Marine National and this collaboration and partnership, Omega has been very quiet. In fact, the first time that I really took notice of the unit Seamaster that we're going to discuss, it was on the wrist of a secret serviceman as he was ushering someone off a stage in quite a historic photograph. Now what we are seeing is that these unit Omegas, they are not watches in Omega's catalog. Their designs are slightly different and one of the details they offer is a solid case back where you can have your military insignia placed as well as your name, your rank, whatever you like. But it's the details about these watches that matter. So for example, the unit Seamaster. It basically takes the no time to die bond watch, the same dimensions, it uses the 8806 caliber, but it tones it way back. Matte finish throughout, blackened hands and plots around the dial. A softer beige loom on the hands, the plots and the bezel. The piece is in stainless steel, but it appears almost entirely brushed. Now what fascinates me is that this particular watch has been seen on the wrists of Danish frogmen, US Navy SEALs, a US Special Service, as well as a special branch of the French police. And it's a piece that in a lot of ways it's quite distinct, but it's also pretty toned down. Of course, what a lot of us would like to see would be the handset changed, maybe the helium escape crown taken off completely, maybe a closer watch adapting elements from the 2254 Seamaster from yesteryear. But as we sit back and we look at this watch as civilians, there is something very appealing about it. You know, it's not as in your face as the regular production No Time to Die model, and maybe it's not as muted as your standard black dial, black bezel Seamaster professional. We can see that those responsible for creating this watch, they are trying to call back to Omega divers of the 1960s and I think if they had their way they would evolve this watch even more. So where this unit Seamaster it's a great looking watch it's quite under the radar. A lot of people know about it it's been talked about quite a bit. The watch I wanted to cover in this video the main piece is the flight qualified Speedmaster. This has been circling social media over the last few weeks and it's basically Omega's rendition, latest rendition of the Flightmaster. Only available to the US Air Force, the US Army and the US Navy. What we can see if we squint our eyes is that it's a model that takes the blueprint from the current Speedmaster 57. It's an all matte finish, it uses the 9900 coaxial movement. But then it just adds tons of details that we like seeing. Elements of Speedmaster Ultraman. Parts from the 1970s Flightmaster with yellow accents. Much like the unit Seamaster, this flight qualified Speedmaster has options for you to engrave the case back. You can add your insignia as well as your rank. And there's so many things about this watch to like. Again, it's 1970s inspired. You can see the distinct airplane at the top of the chronograph running hand. How the hour markers as well as the tachymeter scale have orange accents. Even with the addition of texture to the matte black dial. So what does all of this mean? It means that a brand like Omega is doing work behind the scenes with specific branches of the military, they're creating all of these awesome designs that we are not allowed to see as individuals, unfortunately. We are seeing military spec watches that don't just have insignia options on the case backs, but watches that have entirely unique dials, handsets, loom applications, and all the rest. But it also tells me that this is quite an inspiring time for watch design because we are seeing watches that are hearkening back to the requirements, the designations of the 1960s and the 70s. Has this all been done for publicity? I don't think so, because once again, it hasn't been advertised, hasn't been shared to the wider public. If we didn't know better, if social media didn't exist, if us watch enthusiasts weren't so keen to look at the details, then these watches would just be floating around with, with no real coverage at all. Does this mean then that variations of these watches will help inform the future direction of consumable pieces that we can all get our hands on? I don't know, we will have to wait and see. But I do like to think of watches such as these as prototypes that may down the line inform how these pieces change, evolve and adapt. This Speedmaster might be the next Flightmaster. This Seamaster might be the next 2254. So what are your thoughts around these pieces that Omega does not want us to know about? And thank you as always for taking the time to watch this video. See you in the next one.